Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm happy to be part of this course and having the opportunity to discuss some of these topics and to teach you. Please feel free to ask me any questions to explain further. Today is going to be more of an introductory course on a few different topics that we'll move into greater detail for additional lectures as the course continues, but I'm happy to help as best I can and answer any questions that come up along the way. So, so moving forward here. Hold on, I get, need to get my, there we go. Okay. So for our agenda today, we're first going to talk a bit about what exactly is radiotherapy and go into that in a little more detail and then move into an introduction to physics where we'll discuss some of the important interactions of radiation with water uh, sorry, and matter and the composition of different types of matter, go a bit into the structure of the atom and then discuss the different ionizing radiation types. We'll also discuss an introduction to radiobiology, which looks a bit at the cell cycle and any and discusses some of the ways that radiation damages cells and leads to cell death, which is the goal for cancer treatment. And we will also discuss some of the initial principles of x-ray therapy and get a little bit into the alpha, alpha beta ratio and acute and late effects, as well as the four R's of radiobiology and their implications for our cancer treatment. We'll also talk a bit about fractionation and the treatment, treatment effects, side effects, et cetera, for things involving radiation treatment. Basically, we're, we're trying to answer these questions. These, we're trying to cover these topics and answer questions that will set the base for our knowledge in radiation therapy. And we'll discuss some, of, it'll help us answer some of the questions such as why does the beam energy matter? Why is the imaging that we take important to physicists? And why and how does the doctor determine the prescription? I and mean, we're gonna get into the very beginning of this. These are pretty complex topics, but hopefully we'll set a good foundation for us to continue off of for the rest of the course. And just to remember before we begin, radiation isn't something that we invented. It's something that's been around forever. The life on earth has developed in the presence of radiation, but it's only within the past century that we've been able to harness it in a way that we can use it for treating cancer and other diseases. And so when talking a bit more specifically about radiotherapy, we're talking about the use of this tool, radiation, for the treatment of of patients and to address human diseases that need to be need to be cured or treated effectively for for population health. And so when we talk about radiation and how it interacts with matter, it's important for us to understand the day to day effects of treatment and we need to know what we need to do to achieve the required precision in our treatment and to make it safe and accurate. And then having a good, we may not use all of these tools and this information every day in our daily treatment of patients, but having a good understanding of the concepts that are behind our treatment will allow us to develop our knowledge base as a professional and allow you to have a, a deeper understanding of what's going on when you're treating the patient and contribute, hopefully in the future, contribute to improvements in patient care and research and, and help make us all better therapists and physicians and, and, and nurses as we're working with our patients during the treatment process. So the most common form of radiation that we use is external, external beam radiation treatment. And this uses high energy particles and waves such as photons, which are X-rays and gamma rays or electron or proton rays to treat our patients and kill or damage cancer cells. On the left here, you can see a LINAC where you have the components available, at least in, in the head of the LINAC, and this gives you a kind of an overview of what it looks like inside the machine. And then on the right, we have a picture of a breast cancer patient who's been arranged and positioned for treatment on, on the table for treatment of her breast cancer. So most of the time with external radiation therapy, uh, we're going to be using photons or electrons. I know that other types of types of treatment are available, but these are the most common and these are the ones we want to focus on for this lesson. So with photons, an electron beam is targeted to is targeted um, passes through a metal target which then goes through a primary collimator and then passes through a flattening filter and then a secondary collimator to further refine the beam before it hits the patient. When we're generating electrons, things go in a slightly different configuration. You can adjust the configuration of the components. We retract the metal target right here and then it 
and then the electron beam travels through the primary collimator and into the scattering foil, and then is further refined to the secondary collimator, and then the electron applicator is used to help direct the treatment to the desired area. And this is often used for more shallow treatments such as the such as skin cancers or other other targets that are close to the skin surface. Both forms of these types of treatments act on the DNA that is inside the cells. What it does is it produces small breaks in the DNA and this DNA damage prevents the cancer cells from growing and dividing and ultimately causes the cancer cells to die either quickly after they're treated or, or within a reasonably short period of time. And then we'll get into a little bit more of that when we discuss the cell cycle. So this figure just shows that uh, it gives a good overview of different types of radiation and kind of demonstrates their power to penetrate through things. It, there, this here shows different uh, materials that the beams are traveling through. This is paper, the human body, aluminum, lead, and then concrete, and or sorry, water or concrete. And basically the take home from this is different beams can have, different types of radiation can have vastly different penetrative power. So alpha rays actually have the least penetrative power and can be blocked by something as thin as paper. Beta rays can pass through the body and are blocked more easily with aluminum, but the most penetrative rays are the gamma rays, x-rays, and neutron beams, which can pass entirely through the body depending on the energy and are the ones that are used more commonly for external radiation treatment. So now I'd like to talk a bit about the types of ionizing radiation. There are two basic categories that can be considered. In the first, the radiation consists of charged particles, either electrons or protons, or, or other, other, charged portion, other charged particles with direct ionization properties. And I'll talk about more what talk more about what that means in a bit. The other category of radiation consists of uncharged particles like photons and neutrons which cause indirect ionizations because these are produced mainly by charged, the, the ionizations that occur after these particles, these uncharged particles are, talk, are targeted at tissue are mainly produced by charged secondary particles that are gaining motion through interaction with the materials that they travel through. And it's important to remember the penetration depth depends on the particle, the composition, and the density of the, of the medium and the radiation energy. So how far a beam will penetrate, penetrative than electron beams. This graph shows the percentage of penetration and then measures the depth of penetration in water. When you look at it, you can see the, uh, the X-ray beams can penetrate much further in water, looking at the 6 MB energy beam and a 15 MB energy beam can traverse quite a longer distance and reach their peak dose at a greater depth than different electron beams that, that we can see here. So today we're focusing on photons and there'll be some additional materials that you can reference in the appendix, but basically we're gonna talk about how photons interact with matter. And it will also, we'll also speak a bit to the effect that electrons have on matter as well. So there's three primary um, types of interaction and I have them listed here on the right. You can have the photoelectric effect, which produces an electron, the Compton effect, which has, which produces an electron and additional ionization energy, and then pair production. And remember, electrons do direct, do direct ionization and photons result in when they interact in producing an indirect ionization. On the left, you can see an illustration of the diff of the of the spectrum of light in correlate correlating with the shorter with the wavelength frequency on the left you can see that the gamma rays have a much shorter wavelength and a higher frequency and higher energy and it, the scale proceeds all the way down to radio waves which have much longer wavelengths and lower frequencies and the free the reason this this is included to demonstrate that the frequency and energy of the beam is one of the factors that dictates what effect will happen when it when the when there is interaction with tissue. So, what effect is going to dominate and what factors impact this? It's primarily related to the 
Z number of the absorbing material, as well as the energy of the photon beam. So if we look at photoelectric effect, this happens primarily when there is a lower beam energy and then and, and also a, a lower Z score. But again, it can it is it it has a different distribution as the as the two factors interact, and as you can see from this graph. For the Compton effect, we primarily see this at the mid-range of energies. And again, it interacts with the z-score as illustrated by the graph. And then as we get to the higher beam energies, we can see pair production as the dominant effect. And this, may, this could conceptually correspond to, you would see the photoelectric effect dominating it more at the 100 kV energy level. You would see the Compton effect dominating at the 6 MV energy level and pair production at these higher energies like 15 MV. And taking a step back, we want to think about the complexity of the organism and the complexity of the patients that we're going to be treating. But all of us are essentially made out of atoms, which are then put together to create molecules and organize to create the cell and the organs and the organ systems that we treat. So the, the score, the graph that I was showing you previously kind of breaks it down at the z-score of a single material. But no, he, no human or, or organism that we're treating is that sim simplistic. So you have to think of the z-scores of all of the different materials that you're aiming at and all the different components of the tissues that are being treated. And so it creates a, a complex portrait that needs to be carefully considered as we're moving forward with treatment. And so this brings us to our discussion about how does irradiation travel through impact and produce the um, effects that we see in the human body when we're treating it? So on the right, we have a picture of uh, a CT scan of uh, a human that is, we have an axial, select, axial section through the, through the lower portion of the thorax, as well as the sagittal and coronal views. And you can see that there's different gradations of black, white, and gray representing different tissues in, in the body. And so what exactly is it that produces these variations in, in grayscale that we see here? And, I'm gonna and a lot of this is related to the z-score of the material that we are targeting and imaging. Before I go into that, I wanna talk a little bit about the composition of matter because that is, that is how we get, we, if, by understanding the structure of the atom and the different components, we can then have um, an understanding of where the z-score comes from. So on the left are some basic structures of the atom. You can see the nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. The protons have a positive charge. And then this, this positive charge is balanced by the negative charge of the electrons, which orbit, which have different orbits around the, around the nucleus of the atom. And protons are what are responsible for the positive charge of the nucleus. The Z number equals the pro number of protons in the atom. So the number of protons defines the element in question and helps us name it, but to balance the electric charge, the positive electric charge of the protons in the nucleus, there must be an equivalent number of electrons present in the orbitals of the atom. And, neutron, and remember, neutrons have no charge, but they work to kind of stabilize the nucleus and hold everything together. But the two charged charge particles we keep in mind are the protons and the electrons in this particular situation. So as radiation interacts with matter, it will have different levels of penetration based on the z-score and again, the energy of the beam. So if we're looking at a cone beam CT that uses 120 kV energy, let's say we look at the bone here. Bone is, has a prime, one of its primary components is calcium, which has a high z-score. And so at this area, the way that this is then translated into and analyzed into an image that we would view as a, as a CT scan is it shows it as white. There's a, a lot more absorption of the radiation and this comes out as a, as a bright white. If we look at air, air instead has a low Z score and, and radiation is able to very easily penetrate through the air. And so this is interpreted and presented as an image as a black area in the CT scan. And then everything in between is based on the water, protein, and fat composition of different tissues. And, and so 
the water is one of the primary components of the human body, and this has more of an intermediate z-score compared to air and calcium and bone. So instead, we have these areas of gray, and this is then, so we can see all the different um, aspects and grayscale gradations of the tissue and, and, and help us to visualize the difference area, different areas of the human body based on these differences in absorption. And so the main points to remember from all of this is, again, it all starts with the work of the technologist and getting them set up for a good scan, something that's accurate and clear. And then we can use that imaging. It's very important that we have an accurate representation of the patient and the absorbance of the materials that are, are, are within the area that we're going to be treating, because these images are used by medical physicists to obtain measurements for the treatment plan. And then ultimately, if the treatment plan is accurate and, and the imaging represents the tissues the, uh, accurately, then this will all have a significant effect on the biologic response and degree of side effects that the patient will experience during their treatment process. So it, it's quite a complex process that, that brings us to the creation of a good, um, safe radiation plan. So now, we're, talk, we're, we're looking at how, what happens when the dose has finally reached the atoms, what are the effects, and what factors change the effects, which, which this is a very complicated, these are very complicated questions to answer, and then all of these things are multifactorial, but at least for our introduction, we'll get to some of the, the basics of radiobiology. So radiobiology is the science that studies the phenomenon phenomena that occur in living beings after the absorption of energy from ionizing radiation. And two key points for us to make here, there are two main factors that make radiation ideal for killing cancer cells. Cancer cells grow and divide much, usually grow and divide much faster than normal tissues. And we can take advantage of this because they're not as capable of recovering after treatment due to this disorganized growth. And the fact that they're in a growth cycle more often than normal tissues, it happens that the growth cycle is the most, it, it's the sense that it, and I'll get more into this when we talk about the cell cycle, but it's the sensitive, it's the phase during which the, the cell is sensitive to radiation damage. So we can really harness this to improve the therapeutic index of our treatment and have the highest effect on cancer cells to effectively kill and treat them while at the same time minimizing the effects on normal tissues because they aren't often as dividing as quickly and the repair mechanisms for DNA repair are more intact in normal tissues compared to cancers. So key points to remember when we're going through these next parts of the lecture, radiation acts primarily on the DNA inside the cells, causing breaks in the DNA that either that can be lethal to the cell. And this damage prevents the cell from growing, dividing, and just and, and organizing their cellular, their cellular function in a way that's incompatible with them continuing with division. And then they eventually will, will, will be destroyed either through apoptosis, necrosis, or, or programmed cell death. So for this, it's important for us to have a good understanding, at least a basic understanding of the cell cycle. I talked about cells replicating and growing. Not all cells are in the replication cycle all of the time. Many cells within the human body are in a dormant uh, phase, but cancer cells are more frequently in this growth phase in the majority of the cancers that we treat. So if they're dormant, we call that, or dormant isn't the perfect word for it, but basically the, the phase where they're not replicating is G0, it's the resting phase. There, if there's some stimulus or some problem that moves the cell to move into the growth phase, they first move into the growth phase one, which is G1 here on the figure. During this phase, the cell goes through a significant amount of growth in size and a significant amount of increased metabolism and, and synthesis of proteins. Then it moves into the S phase, which is the DNA replication phase. And during this point, the cell is replicating, the, it's duplicating the DNA so it can be prepared for division. 
after this is completed, it then moves into G2, which is the second secondary growth phase. And this is when you'll see growth of additional organelles, structural elements of the cell so that it can proceed after it's finished with, with com completing all of the components necessary to sustain two cells. It can then move into mitosis where the cell physically splits from the, this, the cell, cell physically splits in two so that you have creation of a daughter cell. And then depending on the tissue or the cell and the um, signals in the environment surrounding the cell, it can either move in back into the resting phase, G0, or go right back into G1 and start replicating again, which is, and, and it's more, more likely that a cancer cell will move more quickly into G1 and have a much shorter time in the G0 phase. So if we look at tissue response over time to radiation, we look first at the immediate response. So the cell is, is exposed to ionizing radiation, and this is going to cause both direct and indirect effects. Ionizing through the direct effects, damage is directly caused to uh, the DNA by the ionizing radiation, or it can cause the, the radiation can impact the formation of free radicals in the cell, which then those free radicals can then also move to damage the DNA. This damage results in, so this, the damage that includes damage to DNA, protein, and lipids results in several downstream consequences. So it's, if, the, if the DNA damage is not repaired, then, the, then it produces a, a lethal effect. The cells are not able to recover, and then necrosis or uncontrolled cell death proceeds from there. If there is defective repair, you can either have the, the mutation can lead to something that is lethal to the cell. So again, you can go down the, the necrosis pathway, or it can lead to non-lethal mutations. And we'll talk a little bit of that in the next phase of this slide. Or it can lead to programmed cell death because the cell can detect that there's been defective repair and too much damage to the DNA. And so it will lead to triggering apoptosis. It's also possible that you could have correct repair of the DNA damage, which is what we hope to see when we have cells that have normal cells that have some radiation damage. And these can then continue and can be repaired and go on to function normally. It's also possible, and this happens again more often in normal tissue, that the cell cycle will be briefly stopped due to damage that's detected by, to the DNA. It will allow time for the cell to repair the DNA and then move on again to survival. And again, this process is usually more intact in normal tissues compared to cancer cells. So moving into the late response, and this can happen over the course of days, years, and in the case of mutations that are passed along, even, uh, even generations. So again, if there's uncontrolled cell death or necrosis, you can have tissue pathology if it's a normal tissue that you're targeting. This is actually the ideal outcome for many um, tumors though. So ultimately we would like to see them see necrosis and apoptosis throughout the population of cells that we're targeting. These non-lethal mutations, as I talked about, can either, if it's, if it's a normal tissue and the tissue recovers, and the mutation is retained in, in, in specific situations, it can be passed on to, it will at least the mutation will remain with the organism and in specific situations, it can be passed on to their, their offspring. Or these non-lethal mutations can cause a new cancer, which is unfortunately a possible side effect of radiation when we're using it to treat an existing cancer. Or if there's enough of a change in the appearance of the cell as it appears to the immune regulatory cells in the body, it can ultimately be eliminated by the immune system. So this is a pretty complex pathway depending on how the cell responds to radiation and DNA damage. And you can see that there's lots of different ways that, the, that this can produce a, a complex combination of results for the, the tissue that's targeted by radiation. So when we're talking about cell damage, one of the key items that's discussed extensively in radiobiology is the linear quadratic model. And this is a model that's used to describe cell survival and um, takes into account certain aspects of the damage that occurs to these cells. So there's two fundamental components of cell damage as we discussed in the prior figure, lethal damage and sublethal damage. Lethal damage produces direct cell death. And sublethal damage means that the damage could be repaired 
or it could cause cell death by accumulation after an additional radiation dose or some other cumulative aberration of the cellular function and cellular processes that lead to ultimately for the cell to not be able to survive long term. The final effect of radiation depends on the type of radiation and the rate at which it's administered because of these complex interactions of these factors that regulate cell repair, cell growth, and DNA damage. And how a cell population responds to radiation depends on how its constituents are distributed in the reproductive cycle or that cell cycle phase that we just, that we reviewed previously at the time that the radiation dose is administered. So the key, th the key concept here is that cells respond differently to damage depending on the type of cell that they are and the phase of the cell cycle that they're in. And we use a term, the alpha-beta ratio, that's what that symbol there means, to describe this difference. It's the relationship between both components, both components of cell death, the direct and indirect components. The alpha component of this relationship corresponds to direct cell death, that is damage caused to the cell that cannot be repaired. And the beta component corresponds to indirect cell death, which is the cell, which is described as the cell dying due to continuous accumulations of sublethal damage. That's no, so it reaches a point where it's no longer possible for the cell to repair this damage. And the main way this happens is because as the dose of radiation increases, the repair mechanisms become saturated. So the cell isn't able to go in and fix all of the things that have, that have gone wrong. And it just, it, so it, it just like accumulation of too many smaller injuries for the cell to be able to continue. So there's several other factors that also influence a cellular response to radiation. We've talked a lot about radiation dose, but dose rate is also very important. It also depends on the part of the body that's irradiated. You saw, as we discussed previously, the there's a huge, the, the Z, there's many different materials that have different Z components within the human body. So the penetration and absorption of the beam is going to be different depending on which area of the body you're treating, whether there's more air or more water or more bone. It also depends on the biology of the cells and the normal tissues that are around it a lot. And, and this kind of plays into the, how plays into how each tissue will respond. And when you talk to the patient about which weight effects and which acute effects they're going to have. A lot of this is dependent on the growth rate of the tissues that are around the cell, uh, that are around the cancer, and just um, many, many factors about the location. It also is related to the duration of exposure to radiation and the presence of radioprotective or radiosensitizing substances such as chemotherapy or other radio or, or radioprotective agents. So Due to the different alpha beta, alpha beta ratio of different cell types, some tissues are relatively sensitive during treatment if they have a high alpha beta ratio and other tissues don't show as much signs of damage until long after treatment if they have a low alpha beta ratio. When we're talking about high, we're talking in the range of 10 gray. And when we're talking about low, we're talking in the range of about three gray. And so most tumors have a high alpha beta ratio, except for there's some exceptions to this, such as melanomas, liposarcomas, um, prostate cancer, and some breast cancers. But in general, for the purposes of our introductory lecture, you should consider most tumors to have a high alpha beta ratio. And this is something that we um, take into account when we are uh, designing our treatment for the particular tumor that's being targeted. And the classic radiobiologic model. This considers the response factors of tissues to irradiation that are triggered after DNA damage. And these effects are known as the four R's of radiobiology, which they're, they're, they're frequently talked about. You'll hear about the four R's often during this course and many other aspects of radiation training. But these are repair, redistribution, reoxygenation, and repopulation. So in this model, the linear quadratic model, irradiation either by direct or indirect action by free radicals causes DNA damage that can lead to a chromosomal aberration that ultimately leads to cell death. And so here I wanted to kind of pull the audience to see what you guys think. And Katie was gonna help me with administering this Zoom pool. That's the Zoom poll, sorry. So the question is which effect describes why normal tissues are more resistant to multiple treatments than cancer cells. A, repair, B, redistribution, 
C, reoxygenation, or D, repopulation? So I've launched the polling, so please go ahead and all of your answers are anonymous. And Katie, will the results pop up for me? I'm not sure, I can read, I can read them out for you. Give everyone a minute or, or a mm -hmm. second to. We're going to talk a bit about this, so don't worry. Just take a good guess on the answer. We're, we're just learning this, so this isn't something that you have to know already. Okay, so we've gotten about 21 of the 40 attendees voting. So any last minute votes? Otherwise, I'll go ahead and close polling. Okay. So the um, overwhelming answer was repair at... 58% followed by reoxygenation, repopulation, and redistribution. So the answer was repair. And, oh yeah, there now the now the results have popped up for me. So that's correct. The irradi in this case, the irradiated tissue in initiates a rapid repair of sublethal sub lesions. These can then become complete between each treatment fraction. And this phenomenon appears more often in tumor tissues and in healthy tissues that are in, uh, included in the radiation field, but it appears more often in healthy tissues. Um, they're better oxygenated than tumorous tissues. They have more intact repair mechanisms, so they're able to repair themselves better. And we will produce fewer toxic effects on healthy tissue than on the tumor because everything's just working in a smoother and more organized fashion in the normal tissues compared to the tumor tissue. So the next Zoom poll, here's our question. Treatment of, treatment of tumor cells on different days improves efficacy against tumor cells, although it prolongs the treatment time. Why is this? And again, we have the same questions, question options. We'll let the poll go for a minute. Okay, ending polling. And... Okay. So I can, yeah, I can see the results, Katie, thanks. I think it's working for me now. Sure. So yeah, um, it looks like we had 27% choose redistribution and 36% reoxygenation and a, about another third choosing repopulation. So the correct answer is redistribution. So it's a little, this is a little mixed. This is the one I wanted to emphasize for this question, but I will for every, I will say that these are multifactorial. And so I think there's a, that you could say that there's aspects of that, of the pro of, of this interaction that could involve other parts of the four R's. But the main focus here is on redistribution. So cells within the cell cycle that as those in sensitive phases G2 and M are preferentially destroyed by radiation. So the G2 and M phases are the phase of the, of the cell cycle where the cell is the most sensitive. And by doing this, it leaves the cells, when those cells die, the most resistant cells are the ones that are left over in the resistant tissue. So, or left over in the tissue after you do the radiation treatment. So in the first treatment, not all cells will be in the G2 or M phase because it's a random distribution. However, when we divide the treatment into different days, we increase the possibility of eventually treating all the cells as the cells move into the next sensitive phase. And you can also have a bit of synchronization as well. So we'll, by making sure that not all the radiation is given all at once, you both move into, you both arrange it so that you're not damaging the normal tissues around the, the tumor as much, but also allow the tumor to time for the cells that were in a resistant phase to move out of that resistant phase into a radiosensitive phase so that the radiation can kill the cells when they're the most vulnerable. And you do this repeatedly over time and you will grab, you will, over the course of the full treatment, kill all of the cells that move into a sensitive cycle a sensitive portion of the cycle. Okay, next question. Why can hyperthermia treatment help improve the damaging effect against cancer cells? Again, we haven't, I haven't given you guys the answer to this. This is for discussion. So pick, pick anything that you feel and we'll talk about it a bit more. Okay, so the vast majority of people picked reoxygenation and that is the correct answer for this particular question. So when the cells closest to a capillary are destroyed, which are the, that means those cells are the most oxygenated because they're closest to the capillaries, the, this basically allows other cells to kind of re, it, it 
it makes those cells the most sensitive to radiation damage. When you have a cell that, and when you add hyperthermia to a, to a, to a tumor or an era, a treatment regimen, it can increase the blood flow to the area that you're treating. And this allows those cells to be most, this most sensitive to. It's not something that is used as often these days. So the hyperthermia concept, I will say, has, was used more commonly in the past uh, and explored more commonly in research studies in the past for tumor treatment, but is not employed, at least in my experience as a physician, often in, in more modern treatment regimens due to like the complexities of setting up the, the timing of the hyperthermia and other issues with toxicity that are associated with it. But this is an important component, at least of um, radiobiology that we should be, we should be aware of. And so for the final question, why is it dangerous to interrupt and delay the completion of treatment? Excellent. Okay. And so 80% of people chose repopulation. Let me move to the next slide. So repopulation is something that's good for irradiated healthy tissues because we want them to be able to start to repair and, and recover from the radiation. But it's not something that we want to allow to happen in the tumor. So if we, if we delay the treatment, the time between radiation fractions that are delivered, there can be a chance for those cells to repopulate and grow back while we wait for the next radiation cycle to come around. So we need to balance out the regenerative capacity of the tumor with the regenerative, regenerative capacity of the normal tissues that it's against. So if repopulation is good in healthy tissues, but bad in tumor tissue. And by having more of a delay in treatment, you're allowing too much repopulation of the tumor in comparison to repopulation of the damaged cells in the normal tissues. And, An important and, note to this. Oh, uh -huh, yeah. We have a, a quick question here from uh, sure. an audience member. Um, let's see, I can read it out if you'd like. Sure, yeah. If there is a break in treatment by virtue of the, of the fact that the machine developed a fault, is it necessary to account for tumor repopulation? So I guess I should, do you mean the machine encountering a fault during that treatment and then within the next hour or a short amount of time, you're able to get the treatment going again? Or are you talking more of a longer break, like uh, a, a day or two that it needs to recover for the machine to be repaired? We'll allow that the person to add something if they would like. But I think given, mm -hmm. given my experience with Africa, with the radiotherapy capacity in Africa, I think it's more of a longer term break. Okay. Yeah. So if there's been a longer term break, if it's a short delay in treatment, like an hour or two, you can just finish delivering the therapy. And there, there theoretically could be some issues with repopulation, but it's not, not much of a concern. If there were more than a day or two of delay for treatment, then you should start to consider that as a, a reason to consider extending the therapy or increasing the dose in, in some manner. If this has particularly been demonstrated in cervical cancers and head and neck cancers and anything with the squamous cell um, histology. So it, it is important and can help, is something you should consider adjusting the dose for, or at least making comp, consider making some compensatory changes. Okay. So I did wanna talk very briefly about accelerated repopulation. So it's actually been shown that after starting treatment, cancer cells start to grow faster after around 21 days. And so for this reason, it's imperative not to let the cancer grow back. It's important to finish the treatment within a reasonable period of time, or else the treatment has to be adjusted to account for the faster growth of cancer cells, which is kind of actually allude, is relevant to the question that was just asked. But also it's something that when I'm talking to my patients, if they're really hesitant about whether they even want to do the radiation treatment, I often will tell them, if you really don't think you wanna do this and you think you're gonna quit like two weeks in, you shouldn't start. If you're pretty sure you're gonna quit, you shouldn't start. I mean, this it's not completely black and white, but I'll kind of lay it out for them. But if we just do part of the treatment in the beginning and we don't finish it, or at least get close to finishing it, we can sometimes leave them in a worse situation than when we've started where I've caused side effects. And now they have a faster regenerating tumor that, that they have to contend with. So it's an important concept, at least in, in that particular situation.
And so I wanted to talk a little bit about optimizing radiotherapy treatment. I know we're running a little short on time, so I'll try to go a little faster these ones. So to achieve a greater death of tumor cells with an adequate repair of the surrounding tissue, and therefore the fewest possible side effects, there are some specific things that we can modify. The total radiation dose, the time interval between fractions, which you don't want to get shorter than, as much as possible, you don't want to get shorter than the minimum time for healthy tissue to recover from the fraction fractionated dose that was just given, and the dose per fraction. And this um, gets us to the different fractionation schemes that are used in, in treatment most commonly. So we talk a lot about conventional or standard fractionation, which is usually 180 to 200 centigrade, or centigrade per day in a single fraction, usually five days a week. Most of the studies are based off of that. This is the ratio, this, this achieves the best therapeutic index in many tumors and um, is usually taken to a dose of 50 to 70 gray in five to eight weeks. I say usually, but obviously the dose is gonna vary incredibly depending on the situation and the, the type of tumor and location where it's targeted. But there's ways that we can modify the fractionation different from the standard or conventional way. One, one way that's been discussed a lot is through hyperfractionation or providing, two, for example, providing two fractions per day of 115 to 120 centigrade five days a week. Now, this obviously uses a lot of machine time and is very inconvenient for the patient. So this isn't used as frequently, but it is an option that, has, that is available in certain appropriate situations. So in this case, each fraction must be separated by the pre, from the previous one by a minimum of six hours. And total doses in this case can get quite a bit higher, upwards of 80 gray, though usually I haven't treated that high. And the purpose of this fractionation is to reduce late toxic effects. As, the incre as an increase in the number of fraction decreases the possibility of repairing sublethal damage in tumor cells. So basically, if you're giving them less of a chance to repair by, by shortening the length of time between radiation treatments, you're, you're able to kill off more of the tumor cells effectively, but still keep it in a range where normal tissues can repair. Hyperfractionation, which we're talking about fraction sizes of 250, 300, 400, 500, et cetera. I've done even much higher for some stereotactic and SBRT treatments. These are most frequently used in either palliative regimens or, as I said, stereotactic radiosurgery treatments. And so basically these are these are often chosen in palliative regimens if they're not being used stereotactically or ablatively to get the treatment done, have it still be effective, but happen over a shorter amount of time. Because for many of our patients that are here for palliative care, they don't want to have to, you don't want the patient to have to be coming into the hospital for many weeks on end. You want to be able to get something done quickly and um, conveniently for the patient so that they can have pain relief, symptom relief, and, and continue having a good quality of life after that without you taking too much of their time by them traveling the hospital. And so there's less, less consideration of late side effects because those are often done in the situation of, of a lower life expectancy. And another key concept to discuss briefly is accelerated fractionation. So this differs from the previous one in that the doses per fraction are, are, are same, like at the conventional fractionation level, but two daily fractions are administered to reach the same total dose in a shorter amount of time. And this has been used in some head and neck regimens that I, I have participated in. And this shortens the treatment time and allows you to increase the efficacy in rapidly proliferating tumors. But you have to understand that the acute and late side effects will be greater. And again, most of the time, we're primarily focusing on conventional or hyperfractionated doses. So this is not something that's used as commonly because of the issues with late side effect, acute and late side effects, but it is an option that's available and appropriately and when applied appropriately. Other varieties and terms you might hear used are modified accelerated fractionation, split course, standard fractionation with concomitant boost, which is where using many IMRT approaches, we will actually do an integrated boost at the same time to allow us to not have to. It allows you to treat two volumes to different levels at the same time, which has a lot of logistical advantages. Okay, sorry, I'll go through these next slides rather quickly here. So speaking briefly about the effects of dose, radiation treatments can be administered following various patterns as we've discussed over the past several slides. Conventional dose res regimens usually use a daily fraction of two gray or 1.8 gray five days a week for several weeks. And fractionation is specifically defined as the number of sessions and the doses per fraction. 
and protraction is related to the total treatment time and overall time that it takes to tr for the patient to complete the course. And this is defined um, as the time between the first and the last session, taking into account any treatment breaks, weekends, or days that the patient is not treated. So fractionation allows us to decrease late complications, but you have to be careful because as I talked about briefly before, in certain cancers, um, especially head and neck squamous cell and cervical cancer, there they have shown directly that the lot that you lose local control of the tumor for any time over a certain time limit for the entire treatment course. And they've even gotten down to in the studies showing that a, for each day that is that it's delayed beyond let's say seven to eight weeks, you can have like a certain percentage loss of local control for each day of extended therapy. So for for, in general, the concept applies to most cancers, but is particularly important in, in certain populations and certain tumor types. But overall, I like to tell my patients, you know, it's okay for us to take a few days off here and there, but if they're missing too many treatments, then we have to move forward. We, we have to push through or find a way to minimize treatment gaps because too long of a treatment time is, is too challenging. It, it produces loss of treatment efficacy. Okay, so that was our brief introduction to all of these very key components to radiation treatment. If you'd like to get into them in a bit more detail, we have links in the slide here to different support materials. If you have issues um, accessing them, just reach out to us and we can make sure that these links are functioning appropriately or get them mailed out to every, emailed out to everybody so that you have access. And thank you. I'd be happy to take questions at this point from anybody. So some books talk about five R's. The one missing in this lecture is radiosensitivity of organs. Was there a reason that this was omitted in this lecture? I have always trained it, trained as in where I discussed the four R's, not the five R's. So I'm less familiar with literature that refer references five, but that concept is completely valid. I think that it's just not something that, you know, when you're coming up with a, a mnemonic or something as a good frequently said title for the things you're going to discuss in the chapter. For me, when I was training, it was always the four R's, but radiosensitivity of the tissues is, is a very important thing to consider. For instance, if I'm treating a tumor in the stomach um, or the small bowel, our dose constraints are, are completely different and more, more challenging because of how sensitive the surrounding small bowel is to radiation treatment versus if you're treating like an extremity lesion or a bony lesion that's not near any radiosensitive tissue. So it is an important, a very important component in every treatment that I do, but just conceptually when we're titling lectures, when I was learning in residency, they always said, oh, the four R's, not the five R's. So it's probably just a difference in our training material, but radiosensitivity is a key concept. Thank you. Next question is, how does time affect treatment if treatment is prolonged, like treatment long, treating long a fraction in step and shoot IMR. Okay, so and I think you're what I think you're asking there, just to make sure I'm interpreting correctly, is the actual time required to deliver the radiation fraction, like the time on the machine at that moment for that for today's fraction, whether that's going to take 15 minutes versus 40 minutes or something like that, and that is a short enough time interval with the types of tissues in the human body that we're targeting, that that's not a critical aspect. I know that if you probably looked at it on an experimental level, if you had those cells in a Petri dish and we're radiating them over time, you might be able to see some differences, but usually human cells, even cancer cells, aren't dividing so rapidly that they would be impacted by radiation delivery over if, the, if, the, if it's a difference in of minutes like minutes, not, not days and hours. That being said, we are starting to look at flash technology, which is extraordinarily rapid delivery of radiation in very high doses. And we're just, that's, that field's just in its infancy, but there may be a difference if you can deliver all of the radiation in a, sing, in a fraction within a few milliseconds. And so that may have some impact on, um, then, then the treatment, the specific fraction treatment time becomes more important. But again, I'm, I'm not an expert in that area. So, and we're just learning how that impacts tissue growth. 
And we had a question about one of the slides that may have been referring to hypofractionation and not hyperfractionation. Maybe you could briefly explain hypo versus hyperfractionation. Mm -hmm. So hypofractionation is when you use a um, larger dose per fraction and hyperfractionation is when you use a smaller dose per fraction to get to the total dose that you're treating. So like if I'm doing S an SBRT treatment or any type of stereotactic treatment, they're usually quite hypofractionated. And, but there are also some, but in certain situations I'll do like for retreatment of head and neck cancers, you, you sometimes can do a hyperfractionated or twice a day radiation treatment approach. And that's using a smaller dose of radiation per fraction. Next question is, what is your take on giving patients with a huge tumor a single fractionation, which is hyper, then giving the patient time for the tumor to shrink, then assess and plan for standard fractionation? Is it possible to shrink the tumor that way? So that's, that's possible. I haven't usually done that. What we, if we're, and, I, and it probably depends on your resources and your situation, but at least in my clinical experience, what we would mainly do is have, if a patient comes in with a tumor that's too large to treat with the normal radiation dose that I would like to apply, and we can't do it safely, we often will have them do induction chemotherapy first. So, or, or go to surgery. It depends on the it entirely depends on the clinical scenario and the tumor that you're treating, but more commonly we'll, we'll have chemotherapy administered to shrink the tumor, and then we'll go in and do radiation. The problem, if you can treat palliatively with a single higher dose, like eight gray and one, see if it starts to shrink a bit, and then come in and treat more after the fact when it's smaller, but you would need to account for the prior radiation dose that was given. And if in the case of a single fraction of radiation given in a very palliative way, if you were able to maintain, obtain reasonable shrinkage from that, then I think that would be reasonable to then do a long, a full treatment course after the fact. But if you give too much radiation in that first palliative treatment, then you might be kind of burning, you might be limiting your radiation options in the future with a longer treatment dose, because many of those treatment regimens can, uh, they, they work with pushing the normal tissue to the maximum of what it can safely tolerate. And so if in the past, you've also previously radiated that tissue, that gives you less room to work with and less, you have to, you would have to probably take your radiation dose to a total radiation dose to a lower level. So you could meet the constraints of the tissue that's adjacent to it. So it's not a technique that it's not an approach that I've used personally, but I rely more on chemotherapy for reduction in size if we can't treat it safely from the beginning with a standard radiation course. Next question is, with regards to interaction of radiation with matter, what interaction does the cone beam CT, Linux, cobalt, and brachytherapy undergo? All of those machines produce similar types of indirect and direct ionizations. So what's different between uh, all the different modalities that you mentioned there is more the energy of the beam and, and whether it's an alpha, alpha particle, beta, uh, alpha particle or beta radiation or um, gamma and X radiation. So that there's differences between each of the different modalities there, but they still at a basic cellular level go undergo the same type of ionization at the tissue level depending on the Z-score and the beam energy, et cetera. And the last question is, having talked about the interaction of radiation with matter, what then would you say is the interaction responsible for most biological damage to the tumor? Is it Compton, pair production, or radioly radiolysis of water plus hydroxyl radicals? It really depends on all of the, on so many different factors related to what type of, what's the energy of the beam, what type of radiation beam is it, and the composition of the tissue. So you, it's, you can't clearly say that across all situations, one is more than the other. I do think that in a good number of situations, the indirect effects are more pronounced than the direct and more pronounced and effective at killing the cell than the long-term, than the direct effects. Because if you, uh, ideally, if you aim the radiation at the cell, you want to have lethal cell break that occurs immediately and you kill the cell and you know that you've given it a, a fatal blow at that moment. But the reality is that by chance, 
many cells are not going to get a lethal injury. And so you rely on lots of sublethal injuries to accumulate to the point that the, that the cell dies. And that's going to happen through a lot of the indirect activities, through generating free radicals and hydrolysis and other things that will cause extensive low-level injury of the cell so that it just can't continue through. But you can't, I can't, because of all the factors involved, you can't say that one always dominates over another or the most of the time one dominates versus another. Okay. So in the case of a recurrence to the same site, after what period of time can a patient be retreated at the same t at the same site like they're a new patient? Okay. So you always have to keep in mind the prior dose of radiation. It's never something that can be completely disregarded, but we do say that if you're considering cumulative radiation dose and considering a retreatment situation, that if it's been around a year or maybe even six months, that's cutting a little close since the prior, but about a year since the prior radiation, you can think about it as if maybe half of the damage from that radiation has been repaired. And so you can consider when you're calculating your total dose of radiation over the patient's lifetime, you can kind of factor that into your equation of saying, hey, if they got, you know, 50 gray to the spinal cord last time, or not well, 45 to the spinal cord last time, but if it's been a year since they've had treatment, we'll consider that to be more of a prior dose of 25 or 30. So you can, and, and that's, it doesn't mean that they didn't get that radiation, but you give it the benefit of the doubt that some of that damage has been repaired so that you may have a little more room to give additional radiation since then it's been a while since their prior treatment, but it never goes back down to zero where you would consider them like a new patient, unless it's a completely new site. If it's a completely new site on the body that's not received radiation, then you can consider that as starting from the beginning. And this is a, a follow-on question to the comment about machines breaking down. And do you continue with conventional, conventional fractionation when there is a, a week-long break in treatment due to machine breakdown? The answer is it depends. It really depends on the on how long the treatment course was. If it was a it was a six week course that we're doing and we had to have a week off, I'd probably step in and just continue as planned. And if it was a if it was one of the populations of cancer that we know have issues with with the delayed treatment with with the losing local control if we miss treatments like cervical cancer or head and neck cancers then i might add a few extra treatments on extra fractions on at the end to compensate for that but there's no perfect answer to that i i really look at the clinical scenario for each patient if it was a palliative regimen and the patient was doing you know 10 fractions and they were able to complete eight fractions and then the machine goes down for a week, I'm not going to have them come back and do an additional two fractions because at that point, it's so far separate from their prior treatment that you're not, not doing them as much benefit. I just say we, we've kind of stopped the therapy at that point. So it really depends on the clinical scenario, but you have to at least think about it and, and keep it in mind when you're, when you're strategizing how to get a patient through treatment. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, that was the last question. So thank you very much, Andrea. It's been a pleasure. Sure. And thank you all for joining.